Here in the Northern Rockies, dark winter months are outlasted in basements, dens, and nooks, where kindred souls gather together to share intel, swap fly patterns, and relive the memories from seasons past. This gathering spot, known locally as the February Room, is the inspiration for this podcast. No matter the season, the door is always open to those with a fly fishing story to tell. Brought to you by CD Fishing USA, the North American distributor for composite development fly rods and accessories. 40 years of Kiwi ingenuity and graphite technology now available at cd-fishing.us or your local CD USA dealer. Follow us on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. And remember to go fishing. Here's your host, the Carnops, and this is the February Room. Livingston, Montana is a mixing pot for artists, writers, and creative types. What do all these eclectic personalities have in common? Fly fishing. My next guest, Don Rogers, has taken note of the, of his surroundings, and he has created a pop-up shop to showcase these artists, as well as running a design group in the outdoor industry. Thank you so much for joining me today, Don. Well, thank you for having me. Well, and we've done some talking back and forth a little bit about your fishing history, so I know you have some fishing stories to share, and I can't wait to hear one. Well, I think all of my fishing stories are, you know, they're all the, pretty much the same once we get to the river. I think the time that's always most memorable to me is sort of the drive home or the drive to the river and the conversations that happen there and the anxiety and the anticipation and everything else that goes along with it. And one of those that really comes to mind is I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and we used to have to drive down to the current river um, in Licking, Missouri, which is about two and a half hours away if we wanted to fish uh, for trout. And I do believe my favorite story of all of them was is one day we were driving down and it's two people who are pretty important in the fly fishing industry, so they'll remain nameless on this story. <laughs> um, but I was fishing with my best friend and he asked if his little brother could come. And his little brother eventually would be a high stick at a junior uh, fly fishing junior world cup for America. So wow. a little research might turn up the family name. But we were driving to the current and we're both from um, not the posh neighborhoods of St. Louis, I shall say. And um, I know that their father likes to pick up roadkill and he likes to pick it up for his beagles. And so I've known that. And one of the brothers said something about sometimes he makes it for us if it's fresh. And I that kind of shocked me as a kid who definitely grew up at the grocery store. <laughs> and so I asked little brother, what was the strangest thing that your dad ever made you? And the answer was sloppy coon. So um, it took me about 25 minutes to get us back on the highway on going through the Ozarks, which there are no straight lines in the Ozarks. So once I didn't kill us in the first fit of laughter, for some very, very foolish reason, I gave a follow up question, which was, how was it? And when he said, you don't ask for seconds, I almost killed us for the second time that day. <laughs> So did you pick up any roadkill on the way? Um, we did go? not pick up any roadkill on the way, but just to finish the story with a punctuation mark, I had a, a little old bird dog, little German wire hair pointer named Trucha. So for those of you that know Latin, you know it's trout or Spanish. Um, and so we got into the car and we started to drive up the hill on the way home. And all of us started to be overcome with the gag reflex and couldn't stop the car fast enough and couldn't pile out of the car fast enough. It would appear that my sweet, sweet true had picked up. I thought it was a turtle and my best friend was thought it was a duck. But whatever it was, it was in the back of my car. So she had brought home a treasure that day. What, what, did you know what it was? Uh, to this day, I thought it was a turtle and Steve thought it was a duck. So oh. all we know is it was disgusting. Oh my gosh. True story too. Just the other day, my neighbor, she's like, Lauren, I need you to go into your front yard. There's something dead right by the pine, by your pine tree. And I said, oh, okay. So I went over there. She's like, I want to make sure it's not a dead body. And this is my neighbor. She's amazing. She's like, she's oh, 80, 83. And I said, oh my gosh. I'm like, okay. First off, I'm like, there's definitely not a dead bodies 
piece of dead body by my pine tree. And I go over there and it reeks, like it smells so bad. And sure enough, there's like this kind of mutilated piece of body and I grab a garbage bag and what it, and I took a close look. Cause I'm like, well, maybe it is a dead body. Like what if I'm going to be on a, I'm going to be on a show and I'm not going to give them like some good details of like how I investigated it. And then it was a squirrel that probably hit a wire or something and just got electrocuted and just burned it to like a crisp. And nice. it just, yeah. So anyways, I can, I can relate to that, that stench of the smell of like an over rotted, dead body or of an animal yeah. it's it's awful it was awful yeah and <laughs> ozarks too um i was editing a show called um dead meat and um kind of like meat eater and so we went to the ozarks and we went to um we went to the lake and um we went paddle paddle fishing have you heard mm -hmm. that and you snag them. I don't think it's you really good. <laughs> you just go there. And it was my first time. And I just remember I got an opportunity after they caught enough fish for the show. Um, they gave me a rod to just try to like sit there. And I caught one. And I remember the first time even seeing one of those things come out, just thinking they look like monsters, like dinosaur looking. And um, so brought a bunch of good memories there for me too, Don. So I was on a, I was a little kid at the Lake of the Ozarks and hadn't gone down there very often and was being taught how to um, water ski and fell off the water ski, you know, obviously fell down about 15 times. But one of the times when I fell down and the boat was circling around about a 10, I, I, to my child's eyes, about a 10 foot long paddlefish came up next to me. And for a kid who was born in 67, which means that Jaws had a very strong impact to see a giant fish while I was in the water, um, it didn't matter that I was in a lake. Uh, irrational fear took over completely. Well, I mean, they're huge. I mean, they, they're huge. Luckily, they're so docile. But could you imagine if those things were actually like a predator fish? That, that'd be I would never go in the water. I mean, they're no, scary. No, we wouldn't looking. be doing this podcast. I would have been a tasty morsel for that thing at around seven. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, gosh, you see some of these pictures of pike too, like in, especially in Germany. I don't know why I see all these photos of people holding these pike, and I think to myself, there is no way in hell I would ever go swimming in that lake if I knew there was a huge pike that like that. I mean, it would eat my foot. It's well, it's like the Wells catfish that they have over there too. I lived in Europe for many years and, and there was a lake in outside of Hamburg that we would go to occasionally. And one day someone caught a catfish that I would have imagined is only possible under one of the bridges on the Mississippi river and was like, yeah, that was the end of that. <laughs> I'm good. I can sit here. I'm going to just enjoy myself. Yeah. Is I'll it, keep an eye on you all and I'll watch the beer. Yeah. Oh, oh some tea. Is that, <laughs> I probably did that totally wrong. <laughs> that is perfect. Oh, thanks. You're, you're a good sport. Um, so, Don, I know we also talked about um, how you got into fly fishing. And you talked about, which I've never had anyone on the podcast talk about fly fishing and seeing mice. It was crazy. I had, moved, I had just moved to Taos, New Mexico and was hiking every canyon that I could find and realized that the sunglasses I had were no good. And so I bought my first pair of polarized <laughs> sunglasses and wasn't fishing yet. And after a long hike was sitting on a rock, just taking off my boots and getting ready to go jump in the car and looked up and I watched what I thought was an air bubble swim across the river. And I was like, I have no idea what I just saw. And I looked down and I watched it come out of the water by my feet and it was a mouse. And I was like, well, that's the craziest damn thing. I didn't know mice swim. And it was the fall in the, you know, in Taos when everything starts to come out of the hills and come down into the valley. And before I know it, I watched another mouse jump in the water. And, and then I looked on the bank and I'm like, this is crazy. There are mice on this bank. <laughs> and that mouse jumped in the water. And from underneath this rock, there was a log that was down. 
I watched a big brown trout come up and annihilate that mouse and thought, I'm not even sure what I just saw, except then I watched that one eat one more and his buddy ghost out and eat one and thought, I've got to do something about this. <laughs> so literally got in the car, drove to Los Rios Anglers and um, bought my first fly fishing setup. And did you buy a mouse pattern? I'm sure they're I probably did buy like... mice pattern. I did buy mice patterns and then they gave me worms and eggs and pheasant tail nymphs so that I could actually catch a fish. <laughs> they're like, I don't think you know exactly what you're gonna do you with this do. mouse. I definitely did not. Well, did you say that it took a while after um, your first rod, it took a, a year till it, it kind of clicked for you? I caught a fish on, I taught, I tried to teach myself how to cast in my driveway. And I went down to the Rio Grande and at the confluence on the Red River. And I caught a rainbow on about my second cast. And then in fact, got skunked for a year. Um, and then finally saw two, we, we ran a restaurant and I saw some guys that I knew were guides in the restaurant on the river. And so I kind of hid behind them and they were having a guide's day off. And I watched how they fished and thought, well, that is nothing like what I'm doing. <laughs> and um, that changed the game. <laughs> you know, how did you continue? Okay, because if I was being skunked for a year, and I'm lucky because my husband um, is uh, was a fishing guide and sometimes does it a little bit on the side. And so he's always teaching me to do better, be better, present better and showing me new. So I've, I feel like I've had this great secret where everyone's like, wow, Lauren, like, how do you get so, how do you keep improving? I'm like, well, my husband keeps pushing me. So how did you continue to want to go fishing being skunked for a year? Like if it was me and I'm so competitive, I'd be like, screw it. This sport isn't for me. I'm done. Well, first off, I grew up a goalie. So instead of trying to win everything in life, I try not to lose <laughs> anything in life. Oh. Um, so it puts us in a different angle. Yeah. Um, and I found fishing to be very therapeutic from the first moment on. Um, the act of the cast in the beginning to me was actually more fascinating than the catching fish. I would spend hours in my yard casting. I thought it was... I don't know, this manifestation of physics in this old way and that you can feel it and you create it was, I don't know, it, it became, I, I've heard it, the term used before, but meditation and movement. And it became a very therapeutic thing for me. I've got a very busy mind that doesn't shut down very quickly. Um, and so... I think by being skunked, it actually forced me to fall in love with this game and actually kind of love it for what it was before I loved it for bagging trout or getting trophies or getting a bigger fish or getting more fish. It, it kind of grounded me in it. I love that. I mean, first off, I love the idea of like the goalie situation, which is probably where you know, I was always in basketball track and, you know, where you, know, you finish first and you get it done. If you aren't good, you know, you're not going to be playing. So um, I love that, you know, so once you kind of got into fly fishing, it kind of, you dived into the outdoor industry. Is that correct? I did. I'd always been fascinated in the outdoor industry. Um, my favorite place is a kid was a shop in St. Louis. It's a famous outdoor shop called the Alpine Shop. And like first communion money, graduation money, confirmation money, anything that I had would go up to the Alpine Shop to buy a pair of boots or to buy wool socks because surely that would keep me alive and make it better or to buy a pocket knife. And so um I fell in love with the outdoors at an early age growing up in a suburb of St. Louis. Um, it's actually one of the reasons that I would eventually go to work for L.L. Bean. Um, I was given an opportunity one day to pick out a Christmas gift out of a catalog, and I saw the Norwegian fisherman sweater in that catalog and just thought to myself, I have to have that. I couldn't, at 10 or 11 years old, I could 
go anywhere. I could trounce anywhere. I can be Admiral Perry. I can be Shackleton. I can do anything. And so that was, I could put on that silly blue and white sweater and explore the world through the back door. And so once that passion was um, settled in, um, tell me a little bit more about like how you're starting to do your own um, kind of like the pop-up business that you just created in Livingston. Yeah. So we have, I started um, a design group because didn't love the corporate world and made it up to the top in the president's role. And I really enjoyed the act of helping people make product, um, getting new customers. So started a design group and needed an office space for that um, in Livingston and couldn't find a nice office. And then one day found a retail shop right off of Main Street um, the price was right, so I grabbed it for our office. And then because I'm either too ADD or um, I, I think the doctor used to say hyperactive, um, I just, and I like to be surrounded by nice things, yes. um, decided to start doing a pop, doing pop-up concepts. And the one that we're currently running at Interval is called fly and it's really angling times art and that started through a relationship with matt and joel from tom morgan rodsmith this winter when we carried um a, so their selection of, of graphite rods that they had finished um, in our shop just to put them in the window so that they can start attracting some new customers um, Tom Morgan is, is, I mean, they're fantastic rods, but at a certain level in this industry, a lot of things become the double secret knock, mm -hmm. just because if a friend doesn't tell you about it, it's really hard to find that out. And we have this opportunity because Livingston is certainly one of the meccas of fly fishing. Yeah. That by putting them in the window, we would, were able to draw in some new customers and they had more contacts um, come from that. And when it came time for Christmas over and thinking about next steps, I had said, how about we do a show in July and August in the shop? We do handcrafted equipment. So featuring Tom Morgan, um, through their relationships, we were able to work with Bozeman Reels and get Bozeman Reels in the shop. And then also through the relationship with Tom Morgan, we were introduced to, um, to Al Swanson, um, who makes the most beautiful fly tubes, uh, fly boxes and um, nets out of wood. Um, they are beyond craftsman, qual craftsman quality. And I figured if I was gonna put all those lovely things in, I better lovely it up with some beautiful art. And when concentrating on the art, I really kind of followed the DNA of what we were doing with the equipment, which was really focusing on things from Southwest Montana. Um, so reached out to a couple of friends who have been guides, have been um, cooks in the outdoor world, like. She's everyone's favorite outdoor chef. <laughs> um, and just other guides and just kind of getting into that network and was able to put together a really cool collection that I couldn't be prouder of right now that's hanging in the shop. I love it. Well, and I think there's something to be said. I mean, a lot of guides, um, I mean, their skills are also much on being connected to the water and knowing what to uh, tell their clients what to throw. But there's also like an element in every guy that I talk to that they have some kind of secret, like artistic view. And um, I wonder if that has to be because of their love for the outdoors and why they're guides is because they also have this type of art, whether it's writing. Like, I mean, I think every guy I've, is either an artist, a writer, um, like they have other passions than just taking people fishing. And so I think it's so great that you're kind of uh, honing in on people's um, artistic skills, especially the guides, because they probably have so many stories that they can put to paper or um, on, on stencils. 
For sure. Like um, we're featuring the photography from a kid by the name of Josh Michaelis, who's a guide here. Um, in typical artist fashion, it's this little thing. And I'm not sure if it's any and I'm not sure you've heard it all from artists that they're usually their worst PR people. <laughs> um remind them all the time that it's freaking brilliant. That's all it is to it. And that's yeah. how you present it. But that's part of the game too, is helping them. Um, but his photography, for example, the ones that we have on the wall from an abstract of a dewy grass field to the morning light on the 89 bridge over, over the Yellowstone on the east side of town, it's really things that only those of us who go out and fish early in the morning or stay late at night, it's, we're the only ones that will ever see this light. Yeah. We're the only ones that will ever see this reflection in a trout's eye. We're the only ones that will see this dewy grass in a morning hike to the river. And those photographs and images that he captures, they're beyond beautiful because they're emotion capturing. They put you yeah. back in your sense of place and they put you back. They give you a sense of time and that one day, that one magic day. Well, and I worked for a photographer before and capturing emotion or, and then color and light, it is beyond. I mean, I thought it was, you know, you think that you're just going in there and you're going to hit your little color correction button. Like it is, it is so intense. Like they're looking at rays, shadows, lines. And, uh, I take a whole lot, a huge appreciation after working with this photographer where I get to see light in such a different way or how people frame their, um, their, 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 uh, photos. So, um, it's great that you're able to find is now, how do people, now do these guides find you or do you find them? Do you reach out to them? So I mostly, um, I hate the word, but curated this one, um, by ourselves. I have a partner in the business, Kendra, who also went out and she is a non-fly person. Um, so it was even more fun saying this is the mission we're on and seeing where her mind took it. Um, and we were able to develop a couple more relationships because of that. Um, so um, in this first go around, it was really us kind of reaching out to a couple of artists. Um, but here, since we're running this event for two months, Livingston has a the, the best night of the summer in Livingston is usually the Art Walk Fridays. Um, and it's the last Friday of, or the fourth Friday of every month. And so for this coming last Friday in August, um, I'm working with a guide by the name of Doug McKnight, who does some beautiful oil paintings. Um, and they are definitely of fish and fishing type related things. And he and I are, he's an old time guide around here. He knows everybody. Um, I only guided for two years here and I avoided the Murray bar at that time. So I didn't really put, get myself into the society. Um, I was also 48. I knew my liver couldn't handle it. Um, so smart man, uh, you know, you, you can't get killed twice. Oh, um, man. I, have, I tried to do it once on my own. So I figured I should avoid that. Um, and so we're curating another group and then on that last week and then then big deal on the, the art walk, we're going to have lots. I'm hoping to have five or six more fishing guides art featured um, for that week and make a make a little fun last week of the show of it. The end of August, you said? That would be August the 27th will be when... Um, we're going to feature more guides work. I love the opportunity. We have, I have very good friends who are very well-trained classic artists that are top-notch world-class artists. And it's a big deal to me when showing anything in our shop that we bring in the next. Um, I've featured their works in both of my shows and it's always an important deal that they that we work together to nominate someone who's never been shown before. Um, so in our February event, we did something on, it was Valentine's, COVID was still going on. I felt the need for fun. We did something um, called Figuratively, which was a celebration of the nude. 
Um, and so we had a oil painter, we had a sculptor, and then um, I really wanted a photographer. So when working with Joe and Nate, we were able to identify um, a young woman by the name of Chloe Nostrand, who is also a fantastic fishing guide. And she was our photographer for the event. And she did some fun photography that we hung. And then we also set her up a little boudoir in the back where she was able to take fun Polaroids that night. Oh my gosh, that is so great. And I mean, especially in February, like the podcast February, I mean, it's kind of gloomy. You need to have a little bit of fun. And what better fun than just doing a like naked showcase. Oh, it was more <laughs> fun than it should have been. I definitely worried that I was going to be typhoid Don when I looked into the room <laughs> at one stage and I saw 60 people drinking wine in my gallery and was like, oh, you note to self, check the New York Times uh, COVID list for the next two weeks to find <laughs> out if you need to leave town or not. No spike. No it's, one of, it's one of those, uh, it, it was so much fun, it hurt kind of feelings. Uh, there was enough whiskey and tequila drank that night that we killed whatever could it kill you. <laughs> <laughs> what was I going to say? Well, I just think it's so great to showcase these artists, especially guides, because I think there's a true burnout with guides, as you probably have had experience when you were doing it for two years. It's hard on your body. It's hard on your mind and mental. I mean, you're kind of always having to... Um, showcase your rivers and also be um a conversationist and so i think having a place where they can start showcasing and maybe it turns into something big maybe it doesn't but just also being appreciative of someone's other artistic skills other than like what they provide and what they can give you on the water i think is so important because these guides work really hard and i think it's also um with the rivers always changing and the population always increasing i think there's a lot more pressure on guides to be um advocates for the river too and so yeah i think it's great that you have a place where they can kind of um, show their other side and now a brief message from our sponsors High performance graphite shouldn't break the bank. Check out the Tamer brand of fly rods for composite developments available in 5, 6, and 8 weight. An unbelievable value at $199, Tamer 4-piece fly rods deliver smooth cast and precise presentation. Our Tamer kits include a Fly Lab pulse reel and weight forward fly line. A river ready kit for under 300 bucks. Go to cd-fishing.us or visit a CD dealer in Idaho, Montana, or Wyoming. And remember to go fishing. Um, when you were guiding for two years, um, was it hard to going from like mainstream work to um, kind of this more laid back lifestyle or is it needed? Um, it was muy needed. Um, yeah. Very, very much so. And I really did not hate giving up the corner office for the center seat. Um, I thought it was fantastic, actually. I'm the oldest of seven, um, and so that's definitely part of the personality. So being able to put a couple people in your boat that don't, that either the beginning of this love affair have never even tried it yet or are way deep into it, um, to be able to sit down with those people and have them in my boat for six and seven hours at a time and be able to have those conversations, I thought was it was great for me. I think it was great for the, the clients and I know it was great for the river and our ecology. And I know you've traveled pretty much everywhere, um, fly fishing. Is there a place for you that is really special that brings the best memories for you with fly fishing? I'm always going to be a home waters guy. Um, that's all because I can get there and I can have my meditation and I can escape quickly and I know it, but I think other than that, for for travel, I've fallen in love with the Yucatan um, in general. Um, in the clothing industry, I've made more pairs of denim jeans in the Yucatan than is countable. Um, and so started a, a work relationship down there. And that turned into having a couple of extra days and someone would send me to uh, they knew that I liked to fly fish, so they were like, well, you should go up here and talk to this guy. And so would have the opportunity to, to jump some baby tarpon, 
which I thought was the most fun a body can have a clothes on. <laughs> and, um, and so started to see the Yucatan um, through a, a very close relationship with a very dear friend, Steve Hempkins, who works with Orvis and is a St. Louis boy. We kind of grew up together um, after a certain stage and he uh, invited me to go down to Isla Holbosch with him and we got to meet Mr. Sandflea. And we got to fish with Sandflea for five days and Sandflea never let us cook a meal. Um, we ate lunch at his house. We went to dinner with them. And if I wasn't in love with the game of fly fishing, that was for sure the moment in time when it was, this community is so big. This community has some of the greatest people in the world in it. And I mean, and then to watch Sandflea's story as he develops the heart problems and watching what Mike Dawes and Worldcast Anglers helped, how they helped out and how the whole world came to help this man who all he'd ever done was make us laugh and yeah. give us some of the most memorable days. It, you know, I've got goosebumps on my arm thinking about it because it was like, it was the shit. Yeah. Like that was, that was when I saw my community in action and like I just fell in love with it and knew that whether I've, you know, we've had horrible conditions this year, horrible mm -hmm. conditions. The river that I fish, um, that's been a water that I fish since 1991, from the day that it dropped below 300 CFS, which is pretty much your means you're going to get leg swept yeah. if you try to cross it, to the moment it closed and the sections that I fish was 11 days long. Well, <sighs> You're going to fall out of love with your sport and you're going to fall in love with the out of your you're going to fall out of love with what you're doing if you don't have a closer connection to it at that stage. Yeah. If it's if you can't go back to the books, if you can't look at the art, if you can't remember the conversations, if you can't remember the drives, if you can't pull up a photo, at you know, because the shop is full at two thirty because Hudal is on. And that's when people come into our shop and share those stories, because the fishing sucked today. I know yeah. it did. I took my friend out Sunday and I still know what I'm doing. And we caught one four inch trout. Um, you know, that doesn't happen very often on the Yellowstone. So it's that connection. That's the thing that keeps us going though. It is so true. I think you say that so well. I mean, I also had a problem, like a guilt if I go fishing, isn't that weird? You know, like it used to be a sport like go out, go fishing. And I want to go fishing. And actually I'm heading to go to Wisconsin and I'm excited because I'm going to go lake fishing. I'm going to go catch some pike. I'm going to catch some bats. Cause I'm like, I don't care. Those fish are tough. Right. And there's, yep. there's plenty of them. And for some reason this year, it seems um, like I'm so happy that you said like, it's good to like reflect on the artwork or um, the pictures, because for some reason getting on the water and we went, my husband and I, this was probably, oh, two weeks ago, we were just kind of doing some fun uh, filming stuff, um, not really fishing at all. And we were on the Clark Fork, or sorry, we were on the Bitterroot. And this was at 10, it was like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the water was 72. And I was just like, gosh, it just even feels so guilty being out here. And I think it's, it's been a hard year for anglers as well as for the fish. Cause it's like, you kind of have this, this weight on you, like, okay, well, I'm so glad I get to, I have some artwork too. And I, I do look at it. I'm like, look how beautiful I'm looking at my nice rainbow right now. And it's beautiful. And yeah, it's good to kind of harbor onto the art that you can no, for look sure. At. This is a good re this is a good summer to reread the longest silence or pick up yeah. your favorite old fishing book and read it again and remember that part of it. You know, I was so proud of a dear friend of mine just came here and he's actually a kindergarten friend. He was big Don and I was little Don. And I wasn't <laughs> that damn short. I never did kind of get over that. But <laughs> You know, he, st he lives in St. Louis. He works a corporate job. He doesn't have the opportunity to get, he's got a couple of kids. They play hockey. You know, that's a time consuming thing. He doesn't get down. He isn't able to get out and fish that much. 
he pulls into my driveway on Friday night and I take him Saturday morning and you know, he's he's new he's not new to the game, but he's still in that stage of his fishing life where it's like, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, gotta catch, gotta more, more, cast, cast, cast. And I really, really gained an all new respect for him when at around ten thirty he's like, It's too warm to fish right now. And I was gonna let him fish until two. He's new, it's Hoodal. I knew I was floating a good section, but I was so proud of him that he said at 10.30, like he broke down his rod and said he, it doesn't feel right. And it was like, thank you, thank you, thank you. Right, and it's that guilt feeling, right? And it, and you probably have more of a testament to this, but I do feel like Montana tends to go through like every three or four years, we get really, really hot. And then we kind of go back down and I'm hoping like my fingers are crossed that we're kind of in this, in that heat, we're on that heat path. And then next summer is going to be nice again. And so, um, my fingers are crossed anyways, cause it's, it's, um, you know, it's, you don't get too many chances to go fishing and hit, hit the hatches, you know, like I was looking forward to go fishing and for some reason the hatch happened earlier, you know, I was like, well, I mean, it's always hard to really put your finger on when that's really going to happen. But I mean, it happened so much earlier this year that I, I missed my opportunity. Yeah, exactly. And on the 7th of July, I don't expect to be standing in a small stream seeing PMDs, drakes and trichos in, the <laughs> in two hour span. Ain't supposed to go down like that. That's no. when I pretty much knew, enjoy everything that you catch today. And gosh, aren't you so shocked that all the big fish are eating your fly immediately upon them hitting the water and then uh, respectfully get out of here? Yeah, yeah get like, out of here. There's something wrong. Yes. Enjoy this one moment in time, but know that this is not a good sign. Yeah, I know. It's I and I think it I think all the anglers are kind of aware of it, you know, yeah. and I know the guides are, and I think that's why I think it's so great that you have this pop-up shop, especially this year, because I think probably guides are going to have to put a lot of focus on some other, you know, elements and, um, their skills, whether it's writing, artwork, photography, whatever you want, they need to do. But I think everyone probably needs a reset, <laughs> especially after coming off of COVID. You're like, oh yeah, things are going back to normal. No, it's not. No, we're going to no, make sure not. the water is going to be a little bit warm. Um, what's your next adventure, Don? Um, my next adventure is still being planned. I have, um, I need to go Dorado fishing. Mm. I have to do it. Me I want to stand in a junk in a clear jungle stream and catch those gold bars. Um, yeah, that would be amazing. That's that's the one that I really want to do next, and that's the next bucket list. Luckily, the one time that I went permit fishing, I caught one, so I was able to scratch that <laughs> off. Um, thank Good God. For you. From what I understand, I'm not even supposed to tell that story anymore. <laughs> about your, oh yeah because it's so incredibly hard to catch you i mean don't you, you know you have to plug my husband is you know he's he's one of those guys that you know he puts a line out he always catches fish and it's the one fish he hasn't caught and it's and beyond me i'm like how is that possible like you you're like the fish whisperer and he's like i don't want to talk about it and so he definitely has the itch so congratulations on catching your permit yeah i couldn't believe it when it started to happen i was like really i caught five permit on this trip and the last one was one of those days it's actually one of my you know one of those wonderful stories because you live in Livingston, um, as a lot of people know who have come through Livingston, we have a little wind problem around here. Yes. It's actually not a problem because it keeps most of the riffraff at bay. <laughs> um, but it was one of those days on a flat in Mexico. And as we we're pulling around, the wind was just howling. The guide was getting ready to call it a day. And I was like, please, just a little bit longer. He's like, but the wind and I'm like, man, I do not live in Paradise Valley for no reason. Let's <laughs> stay here. And um, I saw two very large permit ghost in, laid out a long cast. And of course, right as it unfurled, um, I watched them both turn to the left and somehow even in that howling wind that day was able to pick it up before it landed and lay out another cast in their direction. 
first fish came up to it, thought he was spooked, and that's only because the big fish behind him came in and scooped it up. And wow. 28 pounds of permit later, um, mind you, 15 minutes after we changed to zero X. Um, <sighs> yeah, that freaked me out a bit. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got my 28 pound permit. So I think I'll probably call it a day. On well, the... now you just got to get that Dorado. Now that's, I know. that's your next I thing. I need, to, I need to actually go out and get a Dorado and a permit and a tarpon. Like I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to bring my good energy. And the next time I go and do my big fishing trip, I'm going to get the Grand Slam. I'm just going nice. to go into it. I mean, I'm just putting it out there in the universe because I think the universe will hear me and be like, Lauren deserves Absolutely. it. She talks so much about fishing. She's going to catch them all. And so, uh, whatever fish is out there right now in the ocean, like it's, I'm calling your name. So if hopefully. you don't say it, you can't manifest it. That's, that's what I say every day. That's what I say. Um, so Don, um, if anyone is wanting to check out your pop-up shop, where is it located? We are located, um, in downtown Livingston, right off of main street. Um, we're on East calendar, 115 East calendar, um, just down the block from the Mint. Um, everyone's one of everyone's favorite bars in Livingston. <laughs> it's like everyone loves the Mint. Yeah, well, there's also a Mint and there's also a Mint in every town. So I don't know if it's real fame or not, um, or if it's just everybody's heard of the Mint. I've um, always heard of the Mint in Livingston. Maybe it's yeah. because all the guides go there afterwards. Yeah, yeah. It's either the Murray or the Mint is where you will find your fishing guides in, in <laughs> Livingston, Montana. What would be a little bit unnerving is if you actually go to the Mint and you're like kind of meeting some friends and then tomorrow you're like, wait, I saw you last. Are you okay to go fishing with me today? <laughs> I saw you last night at the Mint. and It didn't seem like you were in mint condition to be on the water today. Um, yeah, I have, um, in my time guiding, I definitely would go into the Murray on occasionally, maybe on a date, maybe doing something else, not hanging out at the guide's corner and laugh <laughs> as I knew that I wasn't doing anything tomorrow, but knew that those guys were, and they left oh. at the same time I did. Someone's going to have some shaky flies yeah. being tied the next morning. There will be no anchoring while we retie. It's not those of those days. <laughs> so true. So this pop-up is next to the Mint, and um, is there an address for it? Yeah, it's 115 East Calendar Street. Okay. And what are the hours of operation? Um, the hours of operation are pretty much whenever we're there. Okay. Um, so we try to maintain between 10 and 6, um, Monday through Friday. We open from 2 to 5 on Saturdays, just as a little celebration of Hoot Owl. Oh, I love um, that. And, and then it's by appointment. Okay. And um, we are happy to open by appointment. And I think it actually gives a better opportunity for us to talk about each artist and have you spend some quality time in the shop. Um, because the collection is everything from the famous Elk Rivers bookstore. So Elk River is a famous bookstore around these parts, been feeding the literati for years um, in Livingston. And uh, they, we're in the process of moving. Um, so Mark honored us with being able to hold his um, rare and exotic um, fishing collection. So that's in the shop. So it gives people, if you come in, you can go look through the books. You can stare at all the sculptures. You can lovingly caress the cork on the Tom Morgan rods. So it's all sorts of fun stuff. And it's been kind of fun. We had a couple of by appointments in the last couple of days and where they've even had their children with them. And the kids love coming in because there's like really stuff to look at. Like Ugh. they can see a giant fly made out that a blacksmith made and just, and they can actually touch it and not worry about it. And oh my gosh, as their a parent, dad can tell them so that nice. we have a sculpture from Liz Lewis where it's bowing to the king. And we've got, I mean, it's gorgeous with a jumping tarpon. And I've listened to dads tell their kids about this is the coolest moment in life, except the guides yelling at you. And it's just <laughs> fun to watch those stories being passed down because 
not all of the best fishing stories are going to happen on the river or on the flat. They're going to be told to that next generation. They're going to be told to those ones that we need to keep feeding this because we need to keep feeding this passion with new people who fall in love with it. Yeah, because with passion, they're going to want to protect it. And so if people aren't caring about the waters or th about their recreation, I mean, it's it can be lost. So I, I agree. Um, and it, you said by appointment. So how do people book an appointment? Um, is that online? Um, so our, our Insta face or all of our social media <laughs> Back is, face. is interval underscore MT. And just to be clever in the fact that I spent too much time in Europe, I spelled interval I N T E R V A L L. Um, and, and then it's underscore MT. And that gives people a really good view. We feature a lot of the art and we feature, um, we tell people about the upcoming events. And then if they want to get in touch with me um, for an appointment, um, should I give the telephone number? Oh yeah, whatever you feel comfortable. Yeah, with. I'm. I'm. As long as you're not trying to tell me my warranty is running out on my car, you're fine to call me. <laughs> um, and that's it. Area code two zero seven two four zero six five nine three. Awesome. And then also, if they wanted to follow you on Instagram, what is your Instagram account? Um, I think I'm just Don Rogers, but I'm gonna open it up and find out. <laughs> I believe you are. It's either Don. I think you're Donald Rogers. I, then I must. I am D A Rogers M T. Go to the February room.com where you can access a complete library of our podcast and read more about our guests, their fishing stories and favorite fly patterns. We're always looking for exceptional fly fishing yarns. And if you have one to spin, shoot us an email at info at the February room.com. The February room is always free. But if you feel like throwing a nickel in the pond, we appreciate any additional listener support. For companies and individuals interested in sponsorship opportunities, please contact us for our media kit. Thanks for stopping by the February Room, and we'll see you down here next week.